Well, good afternoon, everybody. What a perfect day to have the police chief with us. I have to say, a couple residents, when I was reminding them, said, wait, Heather, why are you asking me to go meet the police chief? <laughs> We're so happy to all of you here joining us and all of you at home joining us. This was a resident request when we have our monthly activity planning sessions and was very happy to follow up. And I have to say, Police Chief Martin immediately got back to me and said yes. So what more could you want? Yes. For those of you that don't know, he came to the Franconia Township after serving with the Upper Marion Police Department um, in King of Prussia for 31 years. I lived in Valley Forge, Towers, so I certainly know that area well. And he's the recipient of many awards and commendations throughout his career. He then retired in King of Prussia and in 2018 stepped into the role as police chief in Franconia Township. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Police Chief Michael Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, have to get used to that. I like feel like I'm a supreme being, you know. Um, well, Heather just took my whole introduction. Uh, this was great seeing you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it is a, a real pleasure to be here, and, and I'm honored that uh, somebody would ask to have me come and speak. I, I think it's great. Um, this, this is, I am sure, not the audience that really needs to have police as a friend. I'm sure all of you have a lot of friendly faces here. Uh, there are other audiences I should probably be trying to, uh, to become friends with, but uh, love, love being here and, and, and I'm so happy. I'm very uh, proud of what I do and I love to, to, to meet people and to share uh, experiences, you know, if I can. Um, with everybody and when Heather asked she says hey just come and spend a few minutes and talk about yourself and I said mm, well, there's a subject I know a little bit about anyway um, but it's interesting can you not hear me hmm I don't know it's one of the kids that wants to stay in the back of the room it's okay uh, but I uh, it, it I grew up in the Upper Marion area, and um, I never really had to talk about myself. And, and honestly, I, I hate talking about myself. The, the, uh, the word that I hate most in the English language is I. And, and unfortunately, you're going to hear it a lot today, and I apologize, and it's probably the most that I've used it in a long time. Uh, but I like to use we and, and talk as a team, you know, for my police department. And I never really had to talk about myself because I grew up in that area and everybody knew me and they knew my background. And I, I hired, I hired, oh boy, I married my high school sweetheart. Uh, so she was my best PR person. So she would do all my bragging for me. So then when I came out here, I had to start talking about myself because nobody really knows me. So uh, it's becoming my favorite subject. Uh, <laughs> And you'll probably leave and go, the guy said he doesn't like to talk about himself? Holy moly, we were hoping he would just kind of stop yammering on for a while. Uh, but like Heather said, I, I spent 31 years with the Upper Marion Police Department. I was hired when I was five. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I was very lucky uh, to get hired by that department. It's the first department that I applied to. And I, I came to learn very quickly that a lot of people who wish to become police officers take several tests and apply to numerous different police departments before getting hired. It's a very, used to be a very sought after and competitive job. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays, not many people want the job. Um, can't say that I blame them with, with the way police are portrayed in the media, but again, that's not really reality uh, as it stands. Most. Police departments have a great rapport with their communities. Um, but again, I was very fortunate to get hired uh, with the first police department uh, that I applied to. I was uh, lucky enough to, um, and, and I always say that I'm fortunate and I'm lucky because I honestly believe that. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that if you play your cards the right way and you do things the right way, 
you will get gifts in, in return. And I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go to college on a football scholarship. Uh, my parents would not have been able to, to pay for me to go to college otherwise. So I you know, feel very fortunate about that. So I went to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and I played for Memphis State. So some Southern football was actually a, a, a lot of fun. Um, came back here afterwards, got hired by the police department. I did not finish my degree uh, in Memphis. I left beforehand, much to the dismay of my parents, but uh, I did promise them that I would go back and get my degree, and I did. Um, after graduating from the State Police Academy, getting uh, settled in at the police department, I went back to school and I got my bachelor's degree at St. Joseph's University in Philly, and waited a year and then went on to grad school. So I ended up getting my master's degree, uh, which uh, unfortunately my father didn't live long enough to see that, my mother did, and uh, she was very proud, and, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud that I could uh, keep my promise to them. And uh, St. Joe's actually asked me to stay on and be an adjunct professor. So I, I taught uh, graduate and undergraduate studies in uh, criminology, criminal justice, and sociology. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so I did that for probably about seven years. Uh, and then I was, uh, had an opportunity to go to the FBI National Academy, Upper Marion sent me there. So I stopped teaching and then went down to Quantico, Virginia to the uh, National Academy and came back and never really picked the teaching up again. Um, during my career, uh, I spent 13 years on the SWAT team. So uh, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of pagers going off. You all remember pagers. Talk to kids now, and they're like, what's a pager, you know? Uh, what's a rotary phone? They don't know that either. Uh, so 13 years with the SWAT team, uh, I was able to, to move up the ranks. I became a sergeant. Uh, I was the first community relations officer there. And when I made sergeant, I was able to stay in the community relations unit and run that unit, and then they put me in charge of the drug task force. So the district attorney for Montgomery County has uh, a drug task force where they do undercover operations and narcotics investigations, and they'll utilize uh, local police officers to be part of that team. So uh, some of the larger departments who will have several officers will have a coordinator. So uh, I was the coordinator of that, and then I became a lieutenant, around the Auxiliary Services Division, which is all the civilian employees and the dispatchers, uh, moved into the Patrol Division uh, in Upper Marion. At the time, they had 40, I believe, 42 patrol officers. Um, so I spent about five years there. They had some movement. I was able to move into the Criminal Investigations Division, so I ended my career there as the uh, Investigations Division Commander, uh, overseeing 18 detectives and uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So all of that prepared me for the position that I'm in now and brought me here to, with you fine people. Uh, so a little bit about, um, and if you have any questions as we go through, please raise your hand. It's not gonna ruin my rhythm. If you ask my wife, I have no rhythm. And I will tell you that I certainly do not have any rhythm. Um, but I, you know, I would love to entertain your questions. I made a few notes just to, just to keep me on track here. Uh, a little bit about my philosophies. Um, as I'm sure you know, every police department is different. Every police department has its personality, its culture, uh, regardless of how large or how small they may be, uh, and the community that they serve. Um, so when I came here, uh, it, was, it was a great opportunity to mold a department um, the, the way that I would like to see it run um, and treat people the way I think I would want to be treated. Uh, and, and you get a lot of return if you treat people well. So my philosophies with my officers and my community are the guiding principles would be courtesy, respect, service, and professionalism. I don't think we can go wrong if we kind of follow those. So, you know, I want my officers to look sharp. Um, you know, I want their uniforms to look good. We get custom-made uniforms. I think that's very important. 
Um, you don't want something off the shelf where they look like, you know, it's a Halloween costume or something. You know, when somebody walks in the door, we, we want them to look good. Um, respect for one another. Um, you know, I tell my officers, we are a team, we are a brotherhood, a sisterhood, and we're all in this together. So we treat everybody with respect. Therefore, it's easier to treat your community with respect. Um, service, it's a big reminder that we are here to serve the community. That is what we do. Because if it wasn't for the community, we wouldn't have a job. Um, and most of what we do in any police department, it's not about running around and suppressing crime or solving crime. Most of our days are, are occupied by calls for service, um, ambulance requests. We will go, a young lady in the front was saying that you, you know, went with, ran with the ambulance. Typically when you call the ambulance, who shows up first? The police department. Why? Because we're out on the road. We're moving around. And I know through my career, the most thank you letters that we get at a police department are a result of ambulance calls where a family member feels the need to just reach out and say, you know what, uh, my husband, my wife, my child, somebody, we had to call the ambulance and the officer got there so quickly and they were so kind and they calmed me down and it meant so much. And it, it, and it really does. Most times we don't do a whole lot. We're not, uh, you know, doctors. We wait for the ambulance crew and we help them out. But just being there, I know when you're in a time of need like that, seeing somebody walk through the door who's able to provide some kind of comfort and service goes a long way. So we spend a lot of time with ambulance calls, helping people out. Um, believe it or not, you may believe it, we'll get calls, you know, the old cat stuck in the tree. You, know, you hear that a lot. We, we'll get calls, somebody has a bat in their attic. Uh, their washing machine's overflowing, they can't figure it out, they, they call the police. We don't know what the heck's going on, but it cleans our shoes when we're done, get some suds going there. Um, so we, we get called for a variety of things. We do spend the majority of our day on non-criminal activities. So service, that's, that's really what, what we provide. And professionalism, being, being professional, um, you can have fun. I mean, obviously, I like to have fun. You joke around, you don't take yourself too seriously, but you be professional. And, and I think all of our officers are. I, I really, I say to my wife and, and my family and different people that I talk to, hey, how do you like it out there? I say, I have to pinch myself on a regular basis because this place is fantastic. It is a great community. We have great officers. There's great people out here. Um, it, it's, it really is the garden spot of Montgomery County. Um, so it, it's fantastic. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. What's the scariest thing you were ever involved in? Oh, boy, the scariest thing I was ever involved in. Um, there, there's been a few cases, but I would have to say... Um, had, a, had an incident in, I think it was 1994, um, not long after the Oklahoma City bombing, if you remember that. Um, and everyone was looking for John Doe number two. Um, so it wasn't even my call. Another officer got a call for a suspicious person at a local hotel at the time. It was the Hilton Hotel. And the guy was loitering around out, out front. And I was the backup officer, but the initial officer was kind of stuck in traffic, so I got there first. And um, there's a whole lot of people out front. And actually, there was a Christian convention letting out at that time, so there's people everywhere. And I looked at the bellman and I said, do you have an issue with, with somebody? And he points to this guy, and I'll try to keep the story short. Um, so I walk over and I talk to the guy and, you know, hey, Bud, how you doing? You know, can you talk to me for a minute? He's got a long, like a three-quarter length denim jacket on. And I said, uh, what's your name? And he steps back and he goes, I'm John Doe number two. I went, okay. 
Here we go. All right, John, step over here. Um, and one thing led to another. He, he kind of reached into his jacket. Um, so I grabbed him and he's fiddling around and he's grabbing at my gun. And so I end up taking him to the ground. What did I say a minute ago? There's a Christian convention getting out. So there's, they see this cop, you know, tossing this guy in the air and slamming him and now we're on the ground. Um, but they have no idea that he's reaching for all this stuff. I don't, somehow I was able to call for backup, you know, tell the, the car to get there sooner. They got there and it turns out that he had a, um, a loaded shotgun in the, his jacket. Uh, he had a loaded pistol in his coat pocket. And he was on his way to the White House to meet the president, so, so he thought. Um, so that was probably the scariest. Um, I didn't realize a lot of that stuff as it was happening. Um, but afterwards, you know, you think back on it. And my children were young at the time. And, you know, you think about what, what could have happened. Uh, so I would say that was the, the top one. Yes. What is this shooting? Uh, they had Martha Luther King and they killed him and they had college kids and they killed them too. What should you do? Uh, if you were in a situation when that happens, um, protect yourself, <laughs> you know, hit the, hit the ground, get cover if, if bullets are flying. Um, you know, try to, try to separate yourself from, from that as quickly as you can. Scary thing, it can happen. Okay. Um, let's see, some of, the, some of the things that we have uh, here in, in Franconia that we're working on, if I can get my papers correct here. Um, the priorities uh, that, that I brought to the police department, um, what we really wanted to work on. And I've been here since May of 2018, so it's almost five years. And, and um, I think we're kind of, we're, we're doing a pretty good job. We have a good support staff. Uh, currently, um, Steve Cronin, I don't know if any of you know any of the officers. Uh, Steve has been promoted to sergeant, so he's my second in command and does a great job of running the day-to-day -day operations. And we have two corporals who run the patrol officers. We have two detectives who uh, some of you may get to know. I hope that you don't. And we'll talk about that very briefly at the end, some of the scams and some of the, the things, reasons that you may end up having to call the police. Um, but our philosophies are to be proactive. Uh, I want our officers out there um, being seen in the public, driving through the neighborhoods, uh, speeding, you know, Reckless driving, stop signs, things of that nature, the, the quality of life issues, that's, that's very big to the average person. And the average person doesn't really encounter a police officer very often. And that's something that we as police officers have to keep in mind. Um, you know, we see each other every day. Um, you know, yes, we have a lot of equipment, we have guns, we hats and everything. It, it can look imposing and intimidating. Uh, and we have to remember that if you call the police or there's uh, some event that causes the police to come into your life, be it a car accident, a, a slip and fall, whatever, you're not used to seeing us and dealing with us. And it can be scary. So we, we try to remember that. So being proactive is, is very important in having um, good contact and, and friendly face-to-face -face exposure with, with the public. Um, responsiveness, uh, I am a big proponent of listening. I want our officers to listen. Um, when somebody has a question or a concern, just hear them out. Don't, don't talk over them. So much can be gained by listening. And, uh, you know, investigators, that's, that's key. When you, when you talk to people, when you're interviewing someone, listen to them. Because there's a lot of information in, in small sentences. 
uh, responsiveness. Uh, I, you know, I want, obviously we want people to, um, you know, we want people to know that we're there and that we are listening. Yes. How many uh, officers do you have in the department right now? Great question. How many officers do we have? Currently we have 11, including me. Uh, we are looking to hire one more. Uh, we, we did get approval last year to hire two more full-time officers. And right before we were going to hire them, one of the candidates took a job at another department, which was closer to his home. Uh, so now we're back to the drawing board. Uh, there is a test that was given, a written test, and uh, we're waiting for the results of a physical agility test, which will be in February. Support staff, we have one administrative assistant, and she keeps us all in line. <laughs> um, but it, that's a real good segue, and I can, I can talk about that as far as um, the hiring process um, and how we, what, what officers have to do. We do give a written test. We went in with a consortium of police departments, so I believe there were 18 different police departments and you can take one test and it would go to all of those departments. So if you were interested in, in five of the departments or all 18, you can just submit your name to those departments and take one test, which is, which is a great thing. Follow-up question? County? Montgomery County. Oh. Mm -hmm. Only, yes. So th they're pretty, pretty well spread out. Um, and it's not every department, but this time, you know, about 18 went in on it. So we did give the written test. We had 202 applicants, which, which is low for, for 18 departments. And 142 passed, passing score is 70. So now those 142 uh, in February will go through a physical agility test. So they'll have to do a, a mile and a half run and a uh, 440 yard sprint and push ups and sit ups and things like that. And then those people that pass that test will be brought in for, for interviews. And of those, whoever passes the interview, you know, the, obviously it gets whittled down. Um, then we'll do background investigations on those folks and whittle it down to, you know, candidates that we'd like to hire. So it's, it's very competitive within police departments to find good candidates because the pool now is so, is so low. Um, I, when I got hired, I did go through a consortium test like that. I'm not sure how many departments were there, but there were over 400 people that took the test. Um, now, not all of them, of course, applied to Upper Marion, but um, I was fortunate enough to, to get through that process. Um, they're, they're the same. I think they pretty much uh, hire through Montgomery County. They could with Bucks as well. So are they in the, in the consortium? I don't know if they got in on it this time. I don't believe they did. They could. And it just, it's a timing thing. If you're ready to hire someone and the consortium was going through a test, then you can jump in. They gave a test, I think, two years ago, and we weren't ready to hire, so we didn't, didn't get in. Um, but Telford's an interesting town, and I believe Chief Floyd, who I'm very good friends with, great guy, if I'm not mistaken, I think he told me that Telford is one of only two communities in Pennsylvania that's in two different counties. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the questions are flying now. I love it. Yes, ma'am. We do not have any female officers. Uh, a few years before I got hired, there, there were a couple of female officers, um, but at this point, we do not. Um, I think it would be great if, if we can get a female officer, if we can get minority officers. As, you know, as much diversity as we can get would be fantastic, um, but we're pretty much limited by who applies and who passes the test, and, and that's one thing that I'm pretty strict about. Um, is a testing process. We are, uh, Franconia is a township of the second class, so we can pretty much bring in whoever we want and appoint them. But I think it's very important to go through a testing process because it gives those officers legitimacy. Um, you know, I can promote whoever I want, but you know, what happens then? You know, if, if I promote 
Joe, everyone's going to say, well, you know, Joe's the chief's pet, and he only got the promotion because, you know, him and the chief are buddies. But if I give a test, the same test, and everybody takes that test, and one rises to the top, now there's legitimacy and, and credibility. And that's what happened before, and, and we have a great supervisory staff. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Will do. If you see someone speeding, do you have to chase them or do you have another method of being able to track them down? Okay, if, I, if we see somebody speeding, do we have to chase them or do we have another method of tracking them down? Great question. Um, it all depends. We don't have to chase them. Uh, if, if they're driving in a, in a very, very reckless manner, uh, we won't pursue them if it's a danger, if it's a populated area, and the risks are too great for what the crime that committed uh, would allow. Um, we, we try to catch the violators. Um, th the radio is a fantastic resource. Um, you can't outdrive the radio frequency. So if we know where the person's going, we can radio. And we have a fantastic working relationship with our neighboring police departments here, um, Souderton, Telford, Hatfield, Tomenson, Lower Salford, um, and we're all on the same radio. So we can ask for their assistance if we know where the car is going. Um, so, so those are it. I wish we had some of the cool things that they have on TV, you know, like the spaceships and all that stuff, but we're not there yet. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned about the, the department being a second class. Mm -hmm. what does that um, it's just the type of government. Um, it's, it's not a borough. Uh, there's first class townships, second class townships, um, and it's just the, the, govern, uh, the way they're governed with their board of supervisors and, and, and different rules. Some are a home rule charter, which means like I believe Philadelphia may be a home rule charter. I'm not quite sure. Um, so, so they have certain rules that they need to follow with hiring and things of that nature. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, that's a great question. Uh, that's political. <laughs> I try not to be too political. Uh, but I can, I can find that question out, or the answer, and, and get back to you for sure. And the question was, that we are a, class, a second class township. What, what is the uh, criteria for that? Yes, ma'am. What's the drug Okay, what is the drug problem in Franconia Township, including the schools? Excellent question, get it all the time. It, I would say that it's the same as it is anywhere. Ooh, hello? Battery? <laughs> we do have a light. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. All right, the, the drug problem, um, they, drugs are out there. Uh, they're on the streets, they're in the schools, uh, they're in the businesses. Uh, there, there's always going to be drug abuse. I don't wanna say that we, we don't have a big problem, but we don't have a big problem. Uh, it's, again, it's out there. Uh, for the families who are dealing with family members who have substance abuse, it's, it's a huge problem and it's real. Um, we, we act on tips. We, you know, we're proactive with regard to drugs. Um, and again, it's, it's everywhere. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing overdoses from heroin and fentanyl, um, alcohol, you know, all, all the same things. Obviously, it's, it's not, the numbers aren't as high as they are in another area that's more highly populated, and you look at your demographics. Um, so, you know, we're, we are certainly not immune to it, um, but we're not, we don't have to dedicate a large amount of resources to managing it. Hope that answers your question. Never wanna say that we don't have a problem, don't want to say that we have a huge problem. We, you know, it's, it's there. It's always going to be there, unfortunately. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure, he said he's not going to challenge me, and I appreciate that because you look like a pretty, pretty uh, formidable guy there. Uh, our physical fitness routine. Sadly, um, the only time you really have to pass physical fitness standards is when you get hired. We don't have periodic standards, and at this point, I'm going to do this. <laughs> the equipment does make you look heavier, okay? Um, but, but if an officer uh, looks or appears unfit for duty or, or has an issue, we can certainly test that officer. Um, we can send them for an independent medical examination. Doesn't happen very often. Um, usually, you know, the officers try to stay in shape. And again, every, every police department is different. Um, so. You know, we hope that, that each officer takes it upon themselves to, to keep themselves in shape. Uh, you know, we have our, our health care program offers uh, re reimbursements for gym memberships. We do, we do have some, a little bit of equipment in the township building that we can use. Our township manager, he's a great guy. He's very proactive and very uh, supportive of employees. So, you know, we, we try to to manage health. And, and again, with the healthcare program, there's incentives for different testing, you know, preventative testing and things. So we, we, try, to, we try to keep in shape. Did you ever have to use your gun? Did I ever have to use my gun? Um, thankfully, only to euthanize some animals that were hit by cars or whatever, but I've never had to fire at anybody. I've come close a couple of times, and I'm thankful uh, that I haven't had to. And that's, that's a great point. Most police officers will go through their whole career and never have to discharge their firearm. You know, now you look at the news and you think, you know, it's the wild west, you know, when people just want to get the job, you know, because they're, you know, shoot tin cans off of people's heads. And no, it's, that's not the case. It, it's an awesome responsibility to carry this thing. It really is. And, um, you know, to take someone's freedom is one thing, but to take somebody's life is a really, really big, big thing. And it is not like TV. Um, you know, I know some officers who were involved in shootings on the job, and, you know, they're not out getting a cup of coffee like Clint Eastwood and, you know, you know joking around and waiting for the next job. It's... You know, we're people, just, just like all of you, and it affects everybody, and then nobody takes this job because they want to, you know, injure or maim or kill people. So, thankfully, I have never had to use it. Yes, sir? On that line, has, uh, has the taser uh, replaced a lot, a lot of the use of the... It has. That's a great question. He asked if the taser has replaced a lot of the use for uh, a firearm, and it has. It, it is a, um, it's a, a called a less lethal weapon, and we're always trying to come up with a better, less than lethal option. Um, you know, a baton, if you hit somebody, you know, it, it, it can cause some harm. It, it shouldn't kill them, you know, but if you hit them in the wrong place, it certainly could. Um, a taser is a lot quicker. Again, not like TV, if you tase somebody, they're not unconscious on the ground, you know, twitching for 20 minutes. As soon as the, the taser is released, you're normal. So it's like an electric shock. So if you put your finger in the outlet, you're, you're gonna feel it, but as soon as you pull your finger out, you're done. It's, it's incredibly unpleasant, trust me. <laughs> I've been tased, you know. You don't wanna be tased. Um, but, it, but it has certainly helped. Uh, just like canines, uh, it, it's incredible. You can, you can walk up to people and, um, you know, if they're mad at you and, you know, you can threaten to arrest them and they want to challenge you or you, you pull your taser out and they don't care. But if you bring a dog out, they're like, whoa, whoa. You know, nobody wants to mess with a dog. Uh, so they're a, great, they're a great option too. Do you have one here? We have, the uh, question was, do we have a dog here? We do not. Um, would we get one in the future? Possibly. 
Um, you know, they, they certainly have their purpose. Tracking and apprehension is, is a great tool uh, that, that canines are used for uh, drugs, sniffing, and bomb sniffing. Uh, but it's a big commitment. Um, the dog is assigned to one officer. Typically, the dog goes home with the officer. So there's feeding, boarding. I'm sure many of you have, have, have had pets. Uh, they get sick, just like everybody else, and they get injured. So um, it's, it's an expensive proposition. But we, we do not have one now. Yes, ma'am. I think in the past, we used to have um, bicycle patrols mm -hmm. that would come through our area. I don't know if it was Franconia or Satterton. Uh, does that still happen, or will it be happening? Uh, the question was in the past, there were bicycle patrols. We do have bicycle patrols. We do, uh, Franconia does, Satterton does. I'm not sure if Telford has any bikes, but we, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, got an electric bike, an e-bike, which is great. It's a pedal assist, so it kind of helps out, and you can go a little quicker. Um, but we do have them. They are patrolling. When, when the weather's optimal, they will patrol. Um, if anyone went to the Souderton Christmas Parade, we had two of our officers were on bikes in the rain <laughs> at the parade. So, yes, ma'am, you had a question? I thought I saw another hand. Yes? What problem takes up the most time with your officers? Oh, great question. Which pro what problem takes up the most time with our officers? Um, depends what level. At my level, it's like what I want for lunch. Um, that's a bit, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, our detectives spend a lot of time with credit card fraud. Um, they're, they're very intensive investigations, identity theft, those types of investigations do take a lot of time. For the patrol officer, typically, um, a patrol officer would take a call um, if one of you had your credit card stolen or compromised and you call the police, the uniformed officer comes out, takes the report. If it's something a little more involved that he or she can't handle right then and there, it'll be assigned to a detective for follow-up. So that's kind of the, the way things go. Some of our uniformed officers will they'll do follow-ups, um, but for the most part, uh, patrol officers are tied up with traffic enforcement uh, and those, um, you know, alarms. If, if you have a storm that comes through and the power has a glitch, a lot of alarms go off. So, you know, they're running to, to alarms, thankfully false alarms a lot of times. Um, but I would say in general, the most time intensive crimes are the economic crimes. And, and I'll take this moment to just talk to you all about that. Um, uh, there's a lot of information out there, and I'm sure you, you hear it all the time, but it, it bears repeating. If somebody calls you on your phone and they, they, they tell you that they're from um, the, the IRS or they're from the, the power company or uh, a bank and they need to uh, confirm your personal information don't don't give it to them politely say just mail me a questionnaire and hang up because they should know who you are but those scams are out there so if they if they can get your social security number and your name they'll start opening accounts in your name with that information um, so you know don't don't give any i, I know you want to be trusting we all do um, but you have to kind of draw the line. And some of these people won't take no for an answer. So if you have to be a little rude, be a little rude, hang up, hang up the phone. Yes, sir. What about uh, the calls from the Fraternal Order of Police? What about the calls from the Fraternal Order of Police? That's a good one. Um, you'll, you'll get those, you'll get the police chiefs, um, like a National Police Chiefs Association or something. Um, if, if it's a, the local, you can ask them to send you information in the mail, and typically they will do that. And if you're inclined to donate, go ahead and donate. If you don't want to donate, that's fine too. But I know if, if they say we're from the National Sheriff's Association or something like that, 
Um, and th if they don't want to send you something in the mail, a follow-up, don't give them any credit card information over the phone. Um, you know, they, they should be able to mail you something. They should have your information. Yes, sir. I think I had the most knowledge driven. 45 years driving tractor trailers, 23 years driving school bus. So I had a roughly 255 million miles to my credit. <laughs> Wow. And I've had a physical every year for those 45 years, and a physical every year for the 23 years I drove school bus. I was 89 when I quit driving school bus, and I wow. said, because it's time to quit. Wow. And he agreed with me partially, but he really didn't want me to because they needed drivers. Good for you. And for, and for anyone that couldn't hear, was talking about the amount of years you drove a tractor trailer and a school bus, and my hat is off to you, and I know that you do have to have uh, the medical uh, examinations. My brother drives a tractor trailer, and for his uh, commercial driver's license, he has to get tested all the time as well. So a lot of motorists don't understand what it takes to stop a big truck. Uh, you know, they'll think, oh, it's a big truck, it's slow, I'm going to pull out in front of it. No, no, don't do that. Um, so my hat is off to you, sir. Thank you for, your, for, for doing that, and thank you for driving the, the school children. Because uh, they don't, those big buses don't bend in the middle like a tractor trailer, so taking turns is a little, little tougher. I saw another hand. Yes, ma'am. Why do the police need a donation? <laughs> Question. Question was, why do the police need a donation? Um, I, I know the, uh, the Chiefs Association, they use it for training. Uh, the money that they get um, will have fundraisers, golf outings, things like that, to raise money to put on trainings. And in this way, we don't charge, have to charge the departments because we'll, we'll go out and get instructors. And you have to pay the instructors if you're getting uh, a top professional, maybe you know, from LAPD or somewhere. They're not going to come in for free. Uh, so that's a lot of reason for that. The FOP, there are programs that they put on. Um, I know we have a police association and we get donations and that's one of the things I was going to talk about. Some of the programs that we do uh, on the local level, most of those monies go right back into the community. Um, I know we here in Franconia, our police association does a great job of meeting needs. Uh, we do the shop with a cop program. Uh, every, every year and we'll get funds. And for those of you that don't know what that is, uh, we've, we identify families in need and we'll take them on a kind of a shopping spree. And depending on how, much, how many donations we get, the amount of money that we can allot to each family. And that family goes with an officer and we have volunteers from local businesses and our family members come, my wife and my daughters come and, and they love it. Uh, it's, it's really heartwarming, you, you, you get chills. Uh, the families are so appreciative. So this year, we were able to spend $1,500 on each family. Um, so the children were able to pick out toys, uh, but we always tell them the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to the sock and underwear aisle. <laughs> and everybody's getting socks and underwear, uh, and shoes if you need them, and then the fun stuff later. And the families, uh, the most heartwarming thing is they'll, be buy, they'll buy laundry detergent, they'll buy cleaning supplies, um, pots and pans, and then we always try to pull the, the children aside and say, hey, what do you want to get for mom and dad or whatever? And they'll get, you know, they'll get a little item. So it's, it's fantastic. So we spent about $1,000 uh, at Walmart for all those different things, and then we gave them a $500 coupon for food. So that is a, is a great program. Some of the other things that we use the money for is the Fall Fest. Hope everyone's had a chance to visit that at Franconia Park in October. Um, so, you know, we pay for the fireworks and we get corporate donations. Uh, the, the corporations around here are very, very generous and they're, they're very kind to us. That's a, a few of the things that the, the money is, is used for. So at the bigger level, it's used for to to sub supplement trainings, and at the local level, it's, it's used for community outreach. 
I'm going to start charging you per question. <laughs> Go ahead. How about the uh, funniest or the oddest call that you can remember? Funniest or oddest call? Wow. Well, I, I do know I wasn't there personally, but one of our officers got a call at about 2 in the morning because somebody had a squirrel in their toilet. <laughs> we have no idea how it got there. But the poor guy got up at 2 a.m. to go to the bathroom, and he lifted the seat, and it was splashing and carrying on and a big fuzzy tail. And, um, so that was a good one. <laughs> they were successful. They, they removed the squirrel. <laughs> he was roto rootered <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Wow, I like that question. What nonsense calls should people avoid? Um, you, you know, that, that's a tough one. Um, I would think that anyone that's, that's calling 911 or calling the police actually <laughs> think, you know, that, that's an important call to them. Um, Wow, you caught me off guard with that one. No, that's great. Well, that's good. Maybe there aren't any. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's plenty of calls on a given day where we're thinking, why the heck are they calling us? But, um, you know, off the top of my head, I really, there isn't anything habitual that people just call about and you think, eh, you shouldn't be calling us. But if it comes to me, I told you I played football, right? I probably should have wore my helmet to practice a little more often, but it'll, it'll come to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I, I see you're up here. Am I getting the hook? No, you're not. Okay. Sure. All right. No, it's great. I mean, I, I could do this all day. Well, yeah, until, until dinner time anyway. <laughs> but physically fit, I don't go and eat, eat too much. Yes, sir. Okay, what is the criteria for us to be able to stop someone in another jurisdiction? Really thoughtful question. Uh, if, if we um, encounter a crime or a vehicle code violation in our jurisdiction, we can follow them into another jurisdiction. So, um, you know, our rubber band doesn't stop and snap at the township border. Uh, we can do that. If uh, we are on duty or off duty, and we see a crime being committed wherein there's going to be serious bodily injury, you know, we have a duty to intervene as well. So if, if I'm in a marked car and I'm driving through another town and I, and I see a crime, I can act on it because I am a duly sworn police officer. I certainly need to notify that department to get them in there. But most often, it's uh, any Dukes of Hazard fans here from back in the day? There you go, my, my man. Um, hot pursuit, that, that is a term. If you're in hot pursuit, if you're, you're actively pursuing someone for a crime over the border, that, that's pretty much the, the majority of, of what we get. Anyone else? You're up, you're up to $7.25. Oh, uh, did I move my family up here and how did they like that? I did not have to move my family. We, we don't have a residency requirement. Um, so I live in the Collegeville area and I have lived there for 20, well, probably 30 years. Um, so believe it or not, uh, from my house to Upper Marion Police Department is almost exactly the same distance as it is from my house to the Franconia Police Department. It's, it's, a, it's about 13 miles. And um, it takes me 40 minutes less to get here because I'm not on 422. <laughs> um, so going to King of Prussia. But no, it's great. I have two left turns. I live right off of 113. So I make a left out of my development and I keep going to Allentown Road and I make another left. It's fantastic. I don't, my wife has a sense of direction between the two of us. I will, I will, I will openly admit that. So I can handle two left turns. 
and I'm not a NASCAR driver. <laughs> yes, sir. You've never accused of having shot anybody. Has anybody ever shot you? Ooh. Has anyone ever shot at me or shot me? Thankfully, no and no. <laughs> no. Uh, yes, I, I'm telling you, I've been very, very fortunate. Somebody's looking out for me. Yeah. Like I said, I do, I do know people who have been in that situation, and it's, it's not comfortable. You're in a better neighborhood. You're not I I am in a good neighborhood. Yes, yes. The the poor the poor folks in Philadelphia are they're having a rough time, and you know there's there's a lot of good people in the city of Philadelphia, and they're you know they're just as trapped as everybody else, and it's that's a that's a whole different story. You know, it's another another time, sociological. <laughs> talk. Just gives us another reason to have the police chief back. We can pick there another you go. topic there for you. There you go. All right. Well, I thank you so much. I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And thank you again for coming today. You're welcome.